Thank you so much. I'll share my screen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. It is an honor to speak on behalf of Spark and the Simons Foundation. And um, just going to start with my disclosures of funding and uh, book. And then um, before getting into what I'm going to discuss today, I want to just acknowledge that everything I present is the work of many people, could not be done without this wonderful team. I'll be describing um, some collaborations with Spark and um, cannot be more grateful for the families who participate to make this research possible. So today I'm going to be talking about emotion dysregulation. So what I mean by that is when emotions are stronger than the ability to modify them, um, such that an individual has trouble um, changing the intensity or duration of emotional responses and that it interferes with goals and functioning. So Dr. Mazewski, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we're not seeing your slides. Oh, my. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want you to get. I didn't want you to get too far far along before. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Glad no problem. You, okay. Okay. Looks I was good. thinking that it looked kind of weird. So. Yep, looks good now. All right. Thanks. I'm going <laughs> to use my emotion regulation skills to recover from that little snafu. <laughs> we'll start over again. Um, just to show this for a second, the disclosures, funding, all of the wonderful people who made this research possible, and then the agenda for today. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I really packed a lot into these slides. Um, I'm going to be going over basically some of the key um, findings from our work related to assessment, um, how emotion dysregulation impacts outcomes, risk factors for emotion dysregulation, and intervention development. Um, I always like to think back to where where this all began and how I got into this field. Um, and really it all starts back when I was in college at the William College of William Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. And at that point I knew I wanted to go into psychology. Um, and I had a couple of very formative experiences at Eastern State Hospital, which is the oldest psychiatric hospital in the country. And they had a really unique um, unit for those who were, um, charged with crimes and found not guilty by reason of insanity. And I worked there for a while and thought I wanted to go into forensic psychology. I spent some time uh, volunteering with the Williamsburg um, police force and helped them in their SWAT training as a pretend to be a hostage. So I was really on this path towards forensic psychology. And then I happened to see this flyer. It looked very much like this, a little boy with bright blue eyes. And it said, do you want to help make a miracle? And I thought, yes, I would love to help make a miracle. And um, I responded. And it turned out it was a family looking for help with their nine-year-old um, nonverbal son with autism. So um, I became trained in working with him in applied behavior analysis and spent many, 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 many hours working with him um, over the last two years of my um, college career. Um, and what really struck me about him, we worked on everything from um, being able to walk around the block without darting, um, working on a responsible yes, no response, but he had these behaviors that would pop up um, quite frequently. And just to give an example of one and how we responded, it, um, he would spit into his hands and rub it on my face. And this was pre-COVID and um, it was determined by the supervisors above me that he was doing it for attention seeking. So we decided that I would ignore it. So he would do it. I would act like nothing would happen, um, was happening and lo and behold, it would stop. Um, but then something else always would take its place, sometimes even worse, like fecal smearing. Um, and it always stuck with me that I really felt like we were missing something with him, um, that that wasn't just attention seeking, that there was something going on. Um, and then another really key experience was 
a young man I had the pleasure of working with as a graduate student in clinical psychology for several years. Um, and I was able to watch him blossom into a teenager. He was um, very bright, had autism, um, and really a happy-go-lucky kid until this one time when we had a huge rainstorm and there were tons of grub worms on the um, ground outside of his school. And he became very focused on these grub worms, very upset that people were walking on them without any regard for their safety. Um, and I watched this really derail him in terms of his um, ability to focus at school. It became the primary focus of everything he said socially and just um, uh, really impacted his life. He was unable to really manage that emotional reaction to the grub worm um, situation. So this really all together, these and many more experiences have led me to focus on understanding emotion dysregulation and emotional distress in autism. Um, I continue to be motivated by these emails that I received frequently from parents. And I think just to give a couple more anecdotes before I move on, um, my husband, this is from a mother of a nine-year-old um, son with autism. My husband and I describe him as being at once the most capable and most disabled person we know. His dysregulation manifests in severe emotional outbursts, both verbal and physical. However, when regulated, he's more rational, kind, and mature than his older neurotypical brothers. Emotion dysregulation is absolutely his chief obstacle to living a full life and having the chance to enjoy his many talents, and they are many. And this from a mom of an adult female with ASD, after nine months of intensive sessions twice a week, results nothing short of miraculous. This after trying every other type of therapy and medication out there without addressing her emotion regulation issues, nothing else was possible. So of course I'm biased as I'm an emotion dysregulation researcher, but I really do feel the sentiment strongly and believe it that it's very hard to accomplish other therapies or many life goals with when you're faced with severe emotion dysregulation. So I just feel very passionately that this is a very important area um, to address. So um, one of the barriers that we really faced at the beginning of when we tried to launch this program of research is there really were not good measures of emotion dysregulation in autism. So um, measures developed outside of ASD often don't work quite the same way um, when applied in autistic populations, or they may not be appropriate for use across the autism spectrum. So this we see especially in emotional studies where sometimes Questionnaires might say things like complaints about, worries about that just don't apply to those who aren't speaking. Um, so we endeavored to develop a sensitive measure validated for um, autism that captures emotion dysregulation. Um, and we spent, I'm not gonna go through all the details of this process, but it was uh, several years and a lot of intense um, effort. And I just want to co comment on a couple of the key things that I think led to the success of this work. Um, one of the things that we did was we got parent input from the beginning. Um, of course, the items were generated in large part by things we've heard parents say to us about their child's emotion dysregulation. Um, and then we interviewed parents and had them tell us back in their own words what they think the item was mentioning or getting at. Um, and talk aloud as they answer it so we could hear their thought process um, and get other suggestions and feedback in general regarding wording and content. And then from there, we collected data from three large samples. The first being EN, which I think of as a predecessor to Spark. Um, so it's a national online registry of um, individuals with um, professional ASD diagnoses. Um, the Autism Inpatient Collection, which is a project I've been involved in now for eight years, funded by the Simons Foundation, 
Um, and at this point, we used 432 from the autism inpatient collection. And I feel this was really critical because I think it was important that we included those with the most severe forms of emotion dysregulation. And these are all psychiatric inpatients with ASD. And then we collected a sample of 1,000 from the um, US who are matched to the US census. So this is more of a general population sample. Um, and I decided to avoid boring you with the stats lesson, but uh, one of the things that we did was we used something called item response theory analyses, and it basically gives you a lot more precision. So more like the um, bar per, or bar jump on the left, on the bottom, where you're measuring like very inches, how many inches he's over the bar versus every hurdle counting equally. So we're able to weight different items based on how much they impact overall emotion dysregulation, look at every single item in terms of how it's performing, and also importantly, test things like making sure that the items work um, in the same way for those who are verbal or nonverbal, those who have intellectual disability or those who don't. So all of these things led to the emotion dysregulation inventory or EDI being something that can be really used across the full autism spectrum, regardless of verbal or intellectual disability. We made sure it was sensitive to change. Because of that general population sample, we have norms and cutoffs, which I think is really important because it gives us an opportunity for screening and for monitoring change in treatments and for clinical trials. And importantly, because of the advantages of IRT, we're able to pick the best items and keep it really brief. So we have a seven item form and a six item form, um, making it possible for people to really use this in clinical practice and research. Um, so this is what it looks like. And this is really gonna inform a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, our, our analyses really identified these two key dimensions of emotion dysregulation and autism. The first being reactivity. So that's things like um, really fast emotional reactions that are very strong and difficulty calming down. And dysphoria, which I think of as kind of difficulty upregulating positive affects, so not seeming to enjoy anything, seeming uneasy. Um, so one of the things that brings me great joy is seeing how far we have come um, since we started thinking about, or since at least I really started thinking about emotion dysregulation and autism. We wrote this paper in 2012, um, or we did the search for it in 2012, it was published in 2013. At that time, there were only 15 articles with emotion regulation and autism in the abstract. And when I just updated this um, yesterday, um, there were 324, which is a huge increase over the past decade. And it's very exciting to see um, the amount of emphasis that's been now placed on emotion regulation and autism. And what's even more exciting to me is it doesn't capture what I know is all of the ongoing work in this area. As we track all of the users of the EDI, which is now being used across the globe and all over the US, and um, people are really thinking about emotion dysregulation and autism now in a lot of different contexts. And I thought I would just share some of those examples of where the field is moving. So the first really exciting advancement is we're seeing a lot more use of uh, universal screening uh, for difficulties with emotion dysregulation, both in the US and abroad and in all different kinds of settings, including things like um, outpatient mental health clinics, welfare programs, schools, and private practices. Um, very importantly, we're seeing a lot of use of um, the EDI in treatment trials. So people, a lot of mindfulness treatment studies that are now ongoing, things like neurofeedback, um, looking in forensic settings, um, and also in other kinds of treatments that aren't specifically focused on mental health, like occupational therapy and speech and then also some use in other neurodiverse populations such as ADHD. And then we're seeing what I think are some really neat novel um, ways of thinking about how emotion dysregulation plays a role in ASD and how it might be addressed, such as um, RTMS, therapeutic horseback riding, or looking at the degree 
of um, synchrony between brain activity between a mother and a child. Um, so this um, measure development work has been really exciting for me and also something um, that I think is a need beyond just what we've done so far. So we are doing a lot more work in this area and pretty much all of these studies are SPARC partnerships. Um, we're now developing a self-report form of the EDI for ages 11 through adulthood. Um, and we are finishing the interviews for that project now to finalize the items. Um, we developed a measure of adult functional outcomes and uh, I believe the invites for Spark are gonna go out later in April um, for this project to collect our large sample for psychometric analyses. And then in partnership with Jen Fosfag at Mount Sinai, we're developing a measure of um, autism symptoms for children. Um, we just are finishing this work, which I'm really excited about, um, a version of the EDI for young children ages two to five. Um, Spark was our primary partner for the autism um, data collection. And we have just finished our primary analyses and one of those gratifying times in my career when things work out even better than I might've hoped, we're getting the same reactivity and dysphoria scale really strong items, excellent statistics to support it. So I'm really hoping this can open up new opportunities for us to think about emotion regulation really early in the trajectory of autism. Um, just to give like one example of how that might play a role. Um, this was a recent paper um, that came out, um, not from our group, but a really interesting look at how we can predict adult outcomes from measures taken in early childhood. And they illustrate a really important point about thinking about adult outcomes and um, based on, you know, what do parents really care about? And I'm always interested to see this. It's usually pretty consistent that um, emotional and mental health symptoms um, are among the highest priorities for parents oftentimes, um, which is what you see in the graph on the bottom. And then in the quote that you see there, one of the most striking things to me was what they found was they, there was very limited ability to actually predict those kinds of outcomes, to predict later depression, irritability, positive emotion. Um, with the sorts of measures we're collecting now from um, early childhood, especially things like IQ or autism symptom severity. So I'm really hoping the EDI um, young child can play a role in maybe improving our ability to do this and getting people into preventative interventions or um, treatments earlier um, so that we can have better long-term outcomes. Um, so we have looked um, some in our own group at what predicts um, different levels of severity and change over time in emotion dysregulation. So I'm just gonna briefly describe that study. Um, one of the things that we did when we collected the original data to develop the EDI is we asked parents to rate what's their current um, symptoms over the past seven days and how that compares to their past behavior. Um, so it's not as good as if you were able to collect this data longitudinally over time, which I do really hope we can get funding to do, but at least it gives us some insight into um, how these things change. So I wanted to point out some really interesting um, findings that really showcase the landscape of emotion dysregulation and autism. So I'm gonna walk you through this complicated graph here, which these are density plots of, um, how um, participants were rated in terms of both severity and perceived change over time. So first in these two um, circles are general, are, is a general population sample. And basically what you're seeing here is that in the general population sample, 71% for reactivity and 76% for dysphoria were rated as having low or medium severity of emotion dysregulation that was pretty stable over the course of their life to that point. This is compared in the autism sample to only 20% for reactivity and 
um, rated as both low, medium severity and little change. Also, what's interesting is very few of the general population sample are rated as um, having high emotion dysregulation severity that's stable, whereas um, those numbers are you know, more than five times higher for reactivity being um, severely high and stable in the autism group. So it's a very, very big difference. And the last um, one I really want to point out is this group here. So this is 15% of the autism sample. He was rated as having high severity that's actually better than it used to be. So I think this just really highlights both the, the range of variability in ASD. We see much more variability in emotion dysregulation than you do in the general population and much more likely to have significant difficulties in this area and some with like quite significant difficulties like this group. So we then looked at what might predict emotion dysregulation severity. And I'm just gonna start by walking you through the reactivity first. And what we see is with age, we are seeing decreases in severity. So most parents were rating, things were getting better as they got older, which is encouraging. Um, males tend to have lower severity than females. Um, higher parent education is related to lower severity, greater um, problems with, or greater presence of restricted and repetitive behaviors is related to higher emotion or reactivity severity. And those who are fluently verbal had higher emotion dysregulation severity for reactivity. When you look at dysphoria, you actually see an opposite pattern with age where dysphoria is increasing um, as kids get older. Um, you see the same pattern with restrictive and repetitive behaviors where more is related to more emotion dysregulation severity. And then you see that those with intellectual disability actually have lower dysphoria severity than those without. Um, and again, as a reminder, we check to make sure that this measure works in the same way for those with and without intellectual disability and with and without verbal speaking ability. So I think this, we have some confidence that these findings are not just a fluke of measurement. Um, um, the other thing we've been able to look at is so like, what does that mean? If you, know, if you have high emotion dysregulation severity, how does that impact your life? Um, so we found, um, as you might expect, higher emotion dysregulation is related to higher depression, anxiety, and aggression, and the greater likelihood of more suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And this is important because I think it shows us that we can think of emotion dysregulation as what we call like a transdiagnostic process. So it's something that underlies many different manifestations of mental health difficulties. So that makes me hope if we can improve or decrease emotion dysregulation, that maybe we can have a broad impact on these kinds of outcomes. Um, we also see that higher emotion dysregulation is related to greater use of psychiatric medications, more um, need for crisis evaluations, and a greater likelihood of um, being admitted to a psychiatric hospital inpatient unit. So these were all cross-sectional findings, meaning we we measured these things at the same point in time. It'd be great to measure these longitudinally to see if emotion dysregulation predicts these at a later time period. Also, one um, question is how things unfold moment to moment, which is something that we looked at in our inpatient study. So um, for this, it was children and adolescents from the autism inpatient collection study. All data was collected while they were psychiatric while they were admitted to the hospital and in the hospital. Um, we looked at 53 participants, but um, I wanna stress like what a tremendous job our research assistants did on this and how much work this was. They collected over 500 hours of direct observation of these patients. Um, so basically what they were doing was they were coding um, every time that either emotion dysregulation, self-injurious behavior, or aggression started and stopped um, in these patients. And one of the ideal reasons 
for, or one of the reasons the setting is ideal is obvious, is these are some of the primary reasons that people are admitted to these units. So there's a high occurrence of these behaviors. So our, our number one question really was how often do self-injurious behaviors and aggression occur at the same time as overt emotion dysregulation? And I added in the overt there to emphasize that these are really um, observable signs of emotion dysregulation that they're able to code. Um, so what we found is about half of the time self-injurious behavior happened simultaneously with emotion dysregulation. And about a third of the time, a little more than that, aggression occurred with observable emotion dysregulation. There was a huge amount of variability. These are frequencies. So especially for SIB, a number of kids who never had emotion dysregulation occur with their SIB and a, another big group where it almost always occurred with emotion dysregulation. Um, some similar variability with the aggression. So kind of an interesting process for me with this because I think when we went into this, I was expecting when I first saw this, I was kind of thinking, oh, I would have thought there would be more emotion dysregulation overlapping with these behaviors. Um, and that might be my personal experience um, in this uh, area and working with families. Um, but we had an interesting experience when we submitted this for review where we were questioned, but is the theory really is there any really theory to support emotion dysregulation underlying these behaviors? And truly the predominant theory for both self-injurious behavior and aggression is that they're learned behaviors. Um, so I think what that tells me is that maybe we're really missing something and do need to look more at emotion dysregulation because it is quite a high overlap for these behaviors. And um, um, Anyway, I'm, I'm excited to follow this um, research further um, in terms of understanding these, uh, how emotion and self-injurious behavior and aggression unfold together. And one other big question for me about this in those where we did not observe emotion dysregulation is, is something happening? Are they in distress? And we're just not able to see it. So, maybe they're not able to communicate their emotion dysregulation in the same way or um, tell us that they're feeling upset or maybe their facial expressions don't show it in the same way. So we have also been looking at um, understanding how we can use physiological arousal to understand the occurrence of things like aggression. Um, this is a paper um, that we published uh, 2019 um, using pilot data from collected at Maine Medical Center with Matt Siegel um, from all nonverbal um, inpatients with autism. And basically this was really exciting proof of principle for us that we were able to identify the prediction or the occurrence of aggression um, up to one minute before it occurs based on um, changes in physiological arousal from three minutes before the incident. Um, so, we're now, uh, Matt and I are now working with my collaborators here at the University of Pittsburgh um, to take this a step further. So basically we're expanding from just looking at aggression to looking at self-injurious behavior and emotion dysregulation as well. On the left, you see that those are real time series from um, patients and you can see really different patterns. So the top, like the green is emotion dysregulation um, happening. And then the blue is incidence of self-injurious behavior and red is aggression. And again, you're seeing this huge variability where the example on the top is a kid who almost is always displaying over emotion dysregulation at the same time as behaviors. And whereas the patient on the bottom almost never um, having overt emotion dysregulation, but having very constant uh, self-injurious behavior. So that's just an example of some of the sorts of things we're seeing on the inpatient unit study. So we have 95 um, patients who we've collected that observational coding data together with um, wrist-worn biosensor data to collect heart rate variability, 
dermal activity, uh, movement activity. And basically we're putting that together with machine learning to see if we can identify um, signals in the physio data preceding the onset of emotion dysregulation, self-injurious behavior and aggression um, with the hope that we can use that eventually as a risk alerting device for caregivers or frontline staff, and even also um, as um, something for um, autistic individuals themselves to increase their awareness um, and ability to um, employ emotion regulation strategies in the moment. Um, so while we wait for all of that, um, as of course it is a long process, we, we, I'm encouraged by the fact that there's also a growth in um, what we know about how to intervene with emotion um, regulation in autism. This is a paper that we wrote just kind of summarizing different things people have written about ways to support therapy um, in autism. So we have made a lot of progress in terms of knowing that we need to, or that it's best to really focus on things like emotional intensity, different ways to adjust the therapy that might support learning in terms of um, repetition or the way the session is structured. Um, there's also a lot of emerging treatments specifically focused on emotion regulation in autism. Um, a couple of them here as examples are a STAMP program, which is cognitive behavioral for young children, the Secret Agent Society, another cognitive behavioral program. Um, regulating Together, which is a blend of mindfulness, cognitive behavioral, and parent management, um, and that's an intensive outpatient program for middle-aged children, middle-aged, middle that sounds kind of weird, middle school-aged um, children. And then EASE um, is our program, which I'm going to talk more about. Um, and uh, dialectical behavior therapy is being explored much more in autism, especially in adults. And then a group in King's College London is developing a new program for school-based emotion regulation treatment. I think um, this is really exciting that there's all of this new development in this area, all kind of focusing on different age ranges, different methods. Um, it's all preliminary is what I would say. These are mostly open trials or small case studies, um, but the movement in this area is something to be um, excited about. So now I'm just going to shift for the rest of the talk to describing our emotion regulation um, treatment called EASE. And basically what we were hoping to do with EASE was improve emotion regulation and hope that that has downstream effects on a range of different difficulties you might see, such as decreasing depression, anxiety, behaviors, and improving functioning. Um, this is a collaboration with Susan White at the University of Alabama, as well as um, Kelly Beck and Caitlin Connor here at the University of Pittsburgh. So we have been working on this for quite a while in a um, very thoughtful way. Um, we really started with drafting a manual that stemmed from our collective clinical experience with um, autism. Uh, our team is all um, clinical psychologist and rehab counselor and mindfulness expert. Um, we really drew from the work that we did developing the EDI and that we're really trying to target what those primary difficulties are with emotion dysregulation and autism. Um, and we pulled from the existing emotion regulation research. And then once we had our manual draft, we had this reviewed by parents of um, ch uh, children with autism by autistic adults, by an autistic adult psychiatrist, by clinicians and mindfulness experts. And then we ran a pilot study. And this, in this pilot study, we focused on teenagers, I'm very interested in this transition from adolescence into adulthood. It's often when we see a lot of these problems really peak. Um, so we started that with teens. We're currently running a randomized controlled trial where we're comparing ease to individualized supportive therapy in teenagers and young adults, both at Pitt and the University of Alabama. And we expanded this to include more outcomes as well as EEG. 
Um, and then we also uh, should say that our randomized controlled trial and our pilot study really included primarily those who were verbal um, with um, average, roughly average IQ um, or intellectual ability, but we really wanted to adapt. Um, so we started there, but we as a traditional individual therapy approach, but we really wanted to adapt it to be more accessible to those who might not have as much verbal ability or also have intellectual disability. So we did this in multiple phases where we partnered um, with parents of people, of people who had done the original EASE program, parents of adults um, who with autism and intellectual disability, and we revised the manual. And then we ran a small trial with um, all uh, adolescents and young adults who also have intellectual disability. And then COVID hit <laughs> and then everything shut down. And in the end, this actually was um, good because we were able to take a step back and think about what was working, what wasn't working. And we made more revisions and then we ran another trial with 10 um, more individuals with um, higher support needs. Um, we also have been running qualitative interviews um, with clinicians, parents and autistic adults to understand their mental health needs and how ease might be implemented in community settings, um, merged the man, we're merging the manuals now to hopefully have one program that can be used um, regardless of intellectual disability and um, across adolescents and adults and are applying in the next couple of weeks for a big trial in community clinics to compare at ease to a traditional standard cognitive behavioral program um, not developed for autism. So I'm just gonna highlight a few of the key um, components of ease. So the first thing is it's really not a behavioral approach. It's really focused more on distress tolerance, um, being able to sit with that emotion without um, getting out of control. And it has a strong emphasis on self-compassion and acceptance. And um, this is just a quote from one of the parents in our ease teams trial um, who is autistic herself. Um, so this is her quote, in a lot of places, the focus is on changing the behavior, um, not finding the cause, soothing methods or not accepting. A lot of times autism spaces come across as, how can we make your kid not autistic instead of how can we make your existence better? And I'd say this sort of captures the essence of what we're really trying to do with ease and that we're trying to really um, improve quality of life, improve ability to get, do what you wanna do, not have emotion dysregulation get in your way. Um, and so I, I just appreciate her quote there. Um, another big component of ease is the idea that we're not trying to get rid of negative emotions we all experience negative emotions negative emotions are a very natural um, part of life um, so we really focus on being able to stay in control when experiencing strong negative emotions and it really has a very strong mindfulness emphasis. So mindfulness being paying attention to the present moment sensations, thoughts, and emotions without judgment. Um, this really fits, I think, with what we're trying to do very well, because um, mindfulness can help with increasing awareness, um, which we think can promote the ability to slow down before acting, as well as decrease a tendency to escape and suppress, which is one of the things that the emotion regulation research in autism has revealed um, that many autistic um, adolescents and adults um, report a greater likelihood to use those kinds of strategies as compared to non-autistic individuals. Um, so really think of ease as a mindfulness-based intervention. Um, the other big component of ease is, is we really spend about half of the time and it's a component throughout on awareness with the idea being it's really hard to control your emotions um, and control your actions when you don't 
really realize it until you're like already at a 100 and you're already really, really upset. Um, but it can be very difficult to identify those early changes in emotion or the rising um, emotional arousal. Um, so um, again, we focus on this as a critical skill. These are just some examples of a noticing my emotion skill probably seems familiar to other sort of um, feelings thermometers that are used um, in different treatments. But what I would say is our goal with them is really to create a consistent language and way of communicating about emotions. And that can be very personalized to whatever makes the most sense for that individual, whether it's speaking in numbers, whether it's um, colors, whether it's um, terms, but they all emphasize changes in severity or the dimension of emotion. So we really don't target at all, like understanding if you're feeling scared versus if you're feeling mad versus if you're feeling sad, we really focus more on the intensity of the emotion because I really think that where we really think that's the key to being able to um, regulate um, those feelings. So we really work on cultivating that awareness, both with developing that consistent language to communicate about the emotions and through mindfulness. So this is just an example. Uh, and I like this example because I think it gets at the reality that it's not easy. And, you know, even, um, even for non-autistic individuals, it's not always easy <laughs> um, to do this. So this is a very common quote of um, what might happen after a mindfulness meditation where the therapist might then ask, what did you notice in that meditation? And might hear the response, I don't know. Did you notice anything in your response, in your body? And the response might be calm. Great, where did you notice calm in your body? I don't know. Did you notice your breathing? No response, emotions, no response. And that is fine. So that is normal and we can work on it. So, you know, what this is an example below of one um, from a participant who had that sort of exact scenario in the beginning. So we worked with, she was very into Pokemon. She brought a Pikachu with her to every session, worked on first noticing um, different things about the Pikachu. And then she shifted to being able to notice better external things in the environment, like the fan clicking on, and then did eventually um, learn to then notice more of her internal body sensations, thoughts, and feelings. Um, so that's, that's a common scenario that we do see. Um, let's see, quarter up. I'm going to hopefully get to do this in just a couple of minutes so we have um, more time for questions. Um, so the other thing we really focus on is um, in addition to building awareness through mindfulness, but how to use it in the moment to distract yourself if you need like kind of a quick fix, we emphasize that this is not um, to be used to avoid an activity altogether, but if you need something in the moment to help you remain um, in control. So we discuss very different ways that you might use your mindful attention um, from external things that you might focus on, like sensations of squeezing the animal and focusing all of your attention on that stuffed animal, um, to doing things like focusing on your feet, like wiggling your toes and focusing on the sensation of your foot against the ground or a neutral body sensation, grasping your fingers tightly and focusing on that, squeezing a stress ball. Um, we have learned a lot about mindfulness in autism. We um, published this paper led by Kelly Beck. Um, and, um, you know, mindfulness is not for everyone. I think that's true both in autism and not in autism. Um, but there are ways that um, I think we've learned to make it more successful. And some of it is a little bit counterintuitive um, sometimes where say if someone's having difficulty paying attention the gut reaction might be to shorten the meditations, but we, but it actually seems to be more helpful to um, have them be longer um, and things like that. 
The other thing we really emphasize is the importance of practice and doing um, practices multiple times a day. And after every major skill that we focus on in EASE, we have what we call a community session, which is really just supportive practice in a situation that's as natural as possible. So that might be going outside instead of in the clinic where it's really loud or there are distractions, or it might be bringing in a sibling that you usually have conflict with or playing a game or some scenario that better mimics real life challenges so that you can practice um, in those situations. Um, in the goal, there's also that we can then by increased practice over time, you can see actual physiological changes in decreased reactivity um, and let, allowing you to better control your actions. Um, we, we don't ignore the role of thoughts. Obviously, the way you think about things impacts your emotions. Um, so we, we talk about this briefly and a different ways depending on the cognitive ability. So it might just be like um, helping them, giving them, giving them what we call helper thoughts that might be useful, um, such as just a little longer, emotions are okay, I can try. The bottom picture there is a little card that one of our arti art very artistic um, clients made um, where she had a lot of self-esteem issues in class. So she kept that with her. Remember, we're learning at our own pace. Um, and then we teach for those who are able some more um, uh, in-depth strategies for managing thoughts that might be unhelpful, such as um, distancing and reframing. The other thing that we really um, do in EASE is emphasize a team approach with caregivers or whoever the key person in the individual's life is. Um, I would say the amount of caregiver involvement can vary um, based on the individual circumstance, but what we're talking about with the team model is um, really learning it together, being a good model. So, so using the strategies yourself as a parent, like I notice that I'm getting upset, I'm going to stop and breathe um, and being a team. So instead of saying, I see you need to breathe, like, or go breathe, you're getting upset, um, doing it together. Um, and um, it's different from telling someone uh, what to do or trying to process the emotion. Usually trying to process in the moment of distress just doesn't work. Um, so it's more just helping them um, with the strategies by doing it together. Um, I decided not to bore you with our um, statistics on what we're finding so far, but our results are looking quite good from, the, from our current trial. And we had large positive effect sizes from our pilot, two pilot trials. Um, these are a couple of quotes that I think have more meaning than those numbers. Um, the first about um, being able to get help from the partnering caregiver um, and how that impacted um, has been a huge help for this one family. The other quote getting at um, being able to let the child take some um, of their own control in regulating, um, which can, which is a big um, accomplishment. And then also ability to really, or the seeing the child um, independently begin to do mindfulness on their own at bedtime. Um, and then this is just one quick story of um, a parent um, who wrote this book outside looking in about her, her experience um, parenting in autism. And this is a, a, an excerpt from, um, from the book about her daughter um, who was in our trial. And I'll just briefly read that. Um, the daughter says, I did two things today, two things, what were they? I asked for help in math class and, um, oops, I'm blocked here, I can't see what I have. Um, and my teacher helped me, that's great. I'm glad you're getting what you need by speaking up for yourself, what was the other thing? I raised my hand to answer a question in science and I got it wrong. Okay, you got it wrong, what happened then? 
mom, you don't get it. I got the answer wrong. And I didn't think to myself, I'm so stupid. I didn't get upset for not having the right answer. Um, that's fantastic. So that's really striking because this particular young lady was so anxious when she started our trial about doing anything wrong that we had to actually get an IRB exemption to skip the IQ inclusion criteria because she was unable to get through any testing. So this was really like a huge change for her. Um, I'm just going to close um, with a story of one other young man who was in our trial. He was 18, he was somewhat verbal, um, and he was really triggered by singing and games, and his family was very musical and loved to always sing. <laughs> um, so in one of those community sessions that I mentioned where we really try and practice more in real life, we had his parent and brother um, in with us and um, he was um, playing this game Candyland. Mom started doing some lines from Shrek. He became very upset and spit in his mom's face. So this is, I think a good example of the reality of this work is hard and um, it's not an instant. Um, solution. So he was still struggling this early in treatment. Um, and contrast that to our final session where they played again another game, it's particularly a music game with a lot of singing um, to practice. Again, this is like a real life day, day in and day out thing that causes difficulty in, in their home. Um, and he brought in one of these cards, which is a reminder of the strategies that help him his um, emotional, noticing my emotion scale, the language he preferred was from mundane to irritated to crucial in terms of his emotion intensity. Um, and then he had identified the strategies that were most helpful to him. So with just having the card there and some cueing, he was able to get through this um, without any incidents. And then even more exciting, um, right before his last session, the family was able to travel to see um, the, the, the house from the Christmas story, which is in Ohio, not too far from here. And this was a really big accomplishment for this family. When he first came to us, he was actually opening car doors in the middle of traffic when his family was singing, and they had been nervous to take any trips like this. Um, and this is something they had always wanted to do and they managed to do it singing Christmas carols the whole way there and back and he himself even had fun. So these are the kind of stories we like really love to hear that um, the real life um, changes. So I am about out of time. So I'm just gonna fly through. We're also doing EEG before and after. Um, we're doing this here. Um, so before and after the EASE trial where our goal is really um, to understand if we can identify um, brain responses in during frustration in EEG and then develop a virtual reality environment where we could use that together to cue um, individuals to practice their ease treatment strategies when we detect brain indications that they're experiencing distress. Um, we're also conducting interviews with community providers to understand how ease might best fit in community clinics. We're really trying to focus on um, expanding to adults and older adults. Um, we are finding that there are some differences that adults in these in, um, interviews are reporting that might require some modifications for working with more independent older adults. Um, we're hoping to get into, well, we have a grant under review to develop a measure of suicidality and really take a deep dive into suicidality and mental health in adults with autism. Um, we have a few different neuroimaging studies to understand other mechanisms, looking at early, a study looking at early parent-child um, communication um, related to emotion regulation led by Jesse Northrup. Um, and we're hoping to do continuing work on those with high, for those with high support needs and longitudinal studies. Um, this, I will just end there.